wanted to see what would grow and what wouldn't grow. We're at about 2,900 feet. It's actually a greater revelation. Somehow I think our Father has a purpose in all of this. One of his purposes is to keep us in the Word. But what we're trying to show people is that they can actually do this. And I know they can because we're doing it. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I hope you're enjoying yourselves so far. As you know, this I'm Sebastian, and this is my lovely wife, Tasha. <laughs> we are from Camp to Mead. We're actually, we're actually um, at Camp to Mead right now. Um, so today we're going to be talking about um, how we were led to a remote wilderness location in preparation for the end times. Why we ended up on a ministry outpost property called Camp to Mead and what we've been doing since we have arrived. So, as you guys know, we're quite far from anywhere, from any civilization right now. We are located in the Kootenai boundaries, two and a half uh, kilometers southeast of Kelowna. And actually, as you can see in this picture up here, we are, this is Christian Valley. And it's kind of a, we're on top of a hill and if you see, if you look at the very furthest uh, point, at the end of the valley, that's where Camp Tamid is located. That's where, we're, that's where we're at right now, way far down the valley. Um, so the closest gas station is 65 minutes away. The mail is 50 minutes away. The nearest grocery store is two hours away. And if you want, Things like organic food, Costco, or uh, hardware stores, or anything like that, that's about two and a half hours away. Um, so a lot of people ask me, or I've been asked, what I do for work, seeing as we live so far in the wilderness. And it is, that's a good question, There's, because a man definitely needs to provide for his family, and it, it's, it's a good question. But for the last year and a bit that I've been living out here, I've, I have, I've kind of wondered how I was going to, how I was going to answer that. And w I've been fortunate enough to have actually lot, quite a bit of work down the valley. There's been lots of opportunity for construction work and I've been, we've been so blessed. Our family's been so blessed. The answer that I have come up with now in response is that, is re in response to me living out here and what do I do for work is that this is my work. L here, preparing our ark for our family and the saving of our family is, is our work. And um, we are further blessed out here as well to be a part of this ministry and, and helping this ministry move forward. But anyway, that's my answer to that. I, n I never knew how to answer that. I never knew how to answer what I do for work because it is important. but. Because often people are, are kind of, they're kind of like, what, what would you be doing for work up there? Like, they don't, they're just confused at this, being so far away, being so far away from a anywhere. Well, this is, our, this is our work, and this is the example that we're trying to set, as, uh, along with all of the other families out here as well. Here's our family, and we have six children, ages 3 to 19. We homeschool, and... Um, in fact, the two oldest girls are graduated. Janae, the oldest, um, you can see her right there. She's holding Fia. She is holding the little blonde girl. <laughs> <laughs> and she works just two kilometers down the yes. road, out in the middle of the nowhere, uh, with a 10-year-old autistic boy. She's uh, tutoring him. And we have Holly, the second oldest, taking, right now she's taking clinical herbalism online and helping with teaching two younger children. Bree and Trey are still homeschooling. And um, here's a question for you. Have any of you ever felt the need or desire to leave the city? And even if it isn't the city, just being, you know, kind of a little bit further out of the city. Have you ever been impressed that because our, of the time we're living in, that it might be better 
to live in a country setting. We did. <laughs> we, wanted, we wanted to give our family the best positive chance of having spiritual prosperity as well as being prepared physically for what is to come. So Tash is going to tell our testimony of how we ended up at Camp to Meet, and she tells it the very best, so I'm going to let her <laughs> take over now. Thanks, Seb. Okay, so how did our family end up here at Camp to Meet, and where did we come from? So we were actually living in central Alberta in a small lake community. You can see in the picture here, our little ca house is on the left-hand side there and we had a nice view of the lake. Um, there's approximately 60 homes in that little community that were full-time homes, and we were 20, 25 minutes away from the smallest city right next to us, which was only about 19,000 people. We bought this house in 2012, and there was a reason why this house was on the market for well over a year. It was um, quite a fixer-upper, and we knew we'd have to you know, renovate every square inch of it. And thankfully, both Seb and I are pretty creative, and we both have skills, and he has more skills than I do. So we knew that we could uh, fulfill the vision of fixing up this, cab uh, this house. I say cabin because I'm used to saying cabin now. Um, so I just want to show you just a couple of pictures of the before, because it's kind of part of our testimony. So, so this is the, the kitchen here. You can see there's orange carpet and, and really nice cabinetry. Um, there was only uh, a spiral staircase. That's how we got to the second floor. This is just a few shots of the living room built in the 80s, so nice German family. It came equipped with orange curtains and everything. We were so blessed. <laughs> and again, carpet in the bathroom. It was wonderful. We thought, okay, over time, we can accomplish this goal and we can do this. And at this point, we were not thinking about any kind of end times preparation. Um, I was thinking about my lifelong dream of waking up in my bed and seeing the lake in front of me and um, how we were going to make this home our best and last one because we just renovated another house before that and this was going to be our last renovation. So we knew about the end times. Um, but we were still pretty new in our walk and um, of reading the Bible from front to back. And we had not a lot of knowledge of prophecy. And my background knowledge was when you die, if you're good, you go to heaven and you go to the bad place if you're bad. Right. So I believe that if you just I just taught you, you live a good life and heaven it is. Um, but because of Seb's background, uh, he had a little bit of knowledge of the end times, and he began studying. And as he's studying, he started telling me about all of his wonderful findings uh, regarding the events of the end times and how we could all be martyred and all the plagues and that we'd have to live in caves at the very end of time. And, and I just, I said, don't even talk about it anymore. Like, don't even go there. And so I was afraid for myself, my children, for our families, for our friends, um, you know, my dad and my mom and all of them and my siblings. And I just wanted to put my head in the sand and um, didn't want to think about what was going to happen in the last days. So I was still f just focused on the temporal. Um, and it's all I knew at the time. So over time, Seb did soften his approach and he kept encouraging me, and we began studying prophecy. And um, we came to start keeping the, fall f uh, the feast in the fall of 2013. We had no one to fellowship with at the time, and so we were keeping it online with a group that was online. And we ended up going, driving the 21 hours to Oregon in 2014 for Passover, and that was our first feast that we kept. And it was a real turning point in our walk. It was just an incredible experience. We just couldn't argue with what the Bible was saying, we know that Yeshua himself said, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. We began studying and whatnot, and then in the fall of 2017, I found, you guys might know this guy, Tom Stapleton. And um, Zach was still a baby, and I was nursing him. So uh, while Seb was renovating the house, 
I found his videos and I watched every single video. And I took notes and I compared them to the Bible and I, he sent me some books and I read his books. And then I told Seb, I said, you know what? I said, this man, God's been giving him some truth, right? He's had some truth. And then so I was doing some research and I realized that the ministry property, now they just moved the ministry property from where they were doing ministry feasts from Oyama down here. And I realized it was only a 14 hour drive and we had nobody in Alberta that was keeping the feast. So we thought, wow, this is great. This is close to us. This is not 21 hours, it's only 14 hours. So we attended our first Passover and Unleavened Bread Feast in 2017. And um, we were really excited to have fellowships so close to us. And this is cabin 11 at Camp Tamid where we stayed for our first feast. And we felt like real pioneers when we came. We had, at that time, there was no power in the cabin and there's still no running water, but there's no power. Um, there's a little outhouse back over there. So we use the outhouse for the most part when we're at the cabin and um, we learned to cook on the wood burning stove. We decided before we came, we asked if we could come a few days earlier because we wanted to help out and we didn't know anyone, but we said, can we come, can we help? So Seb was swiftly put to work and if... Uh, yeah, it was fun. Yeah. So this here is actually, if, if you've seen Tom and Judy's place, that right there where that ladder is, is uh, where the stairs go up. It was just a little kind of a shell, I guess. That's the upper room. Yeah. And so you put in windows that day with another fellow. Yep, yep. And did. they were working really hard to get those windows in because that's where the youth class had to be held, so they needed to get them done. And uh, so later on, this was actually converted into what Tom and Judy live right now. So we helped out chopping wood and um, in the kitchen, and we took in the whole week of the feast, and we left that property from that week with a new sense of hope with all that we had learned and experienced and it was just really wonderful. Of course, every time you go to a feast or you get together and you study with anyone, you get this little bit of a fire underneath of you, and that's what kind of happened to us. And the more you learn and the more you study, that fear you know, kind of goes away for you or that unknown goes away from you. And so for us, especially for me, the more we knew, the less fearful I became. And um, so that's why we say Bible knowledge plus the leading of the Holy Spirit. Equal, it literally equals destruction of fear. Do you guys, would you agree? Yeah. 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 So we had heard from God the year before to go to the mountains. That's what he told us the year before, but we hadn't taken that seriously yet. And um, now we knew that we had to actually listen to that call. And by going to the feast and living in the wilderness, that also dispelled another fear because now we were like, we could do this. Like, you know, if we're going to go to the wilderness, we can live off grid and we can, we can be sustainable and we can do this. So that was a really good um, peek into what we might see if we actually were to get to that point. So now we had a vision of where to begin. But back to Alberta and back to our reality. There's Seb, he's... Um, we did three dormers in this place, so this was in November, and it was getting a little cold. <laughs> and we had opened up the side of the, this house in three different spots to put in dormers. We had a house that was still in full renovation. Here he is putting in the stairs, the new stairs, and he got them put in. I said, you need to get this for me for my birthday present, and he got it in at 12.05. It was the next day, but he got it in just in time. Um, but we were in this full renovation, and now we were feeling this pressure, this, this call to, to go to the mountain. So we kind of felt trapped, and, um, and we knew that we had so much to do, and we couldn't go anywhere unless we finished this renovation, because, I mean, who's going to buy this, right? So we were a one-income family with renovation and vehicle debt, and we needed more money to be able to finish the renovation, uh, to even sell the house, and it seemed impossible at the time uh, because we knew we couldn't sell our house until it was finished. Um, with Seb working, he would work on contracts, and then for a few months, and then he'd come back and he'd work on the house for a few months until it was finished, and uh, so there was not really any extra income to pay off any of our other debts that we had. But we'd come to the realization that, you know, God really doesn't like debt. He doesn't want us to serve 
you know, it says you can't serve God and mammon at the same time. So um, we purposed in our hearts, and we said, you know what, God, if you can help us to finish this house, we will never go into debt again. We made that promise and um, uh, so that we could pay off our debt and be debt-free. But trials come, and Seb was working on a new build, and I got a phone call one night, and he had fallen off of a 14-foot wall head first, and he uh, dislocated and broke his arm. And it was, he was really fortunate. I think the angels were looking out after him because uh, they were going to be pouring concrete down on the floor, and all the rebar was sticking up out of the ground. And where he fell was in the one spot that had no rebar. So um, that set us back. It was about three months before he could actually start, you know, working for other people again. He kind of pecked away at the house, but... So over those years of renovation, and the kids were a very huge part of this as well, they were, you know, pretty young at the time, but they were doing quite a bit. There's Bree, she's helping me. And um, there were times where we literally had to um, ration food for a month at a time. And Seb, you want to tell them what you what you'd eat. The kids laugh, like we laugh about it to this day, but we would just look at them and go, oh my goodness, you're crazy. What would you eat? Uh, bee pollen. And? And molasses? <laughs> I can't remember what it was exactly. He said it gave him all kinds of energy. <laughs> that would be like his breakfast. And um, so he'd go work on a contract, but sometimes our, his customers wouldn't pay him for months. One time it was six months that they didn't pay. And it was a substantial amount of money. You know, you, you kind of count on that when you don't get paid. It's like, okay. So, but God, you know, he kept showing us that he was there. We never missed paying a bill. Somehow we managed to pay our bills. We never missed that. And we still managed to tithe. And, and, um, and just when we didn't think that we were going to have enough groceries maybe to get us through the week, you know, Grammy would send home with the kids uh, potatoes and, and carrots and tomatoes. And, you know, that would get us through. And, um, or our neighbor, they had chickens and they say, oh, we're going away for the weekend. Could you look after our chickens? And, you know, we'll give you all of our eggs, you know, little things like that. So then God did a great thing and he gave Seb work right in our community. And he literally put his tools in his wheelbarrow and off to work he went. And he was home for lunch every day and, you know, the girls would bake him something and they'd run it over and it was just really great. And that was for the previous two years before we moved, that was kind of how our life was at that time. So we knew that budgeting and uh, denial of any kind of indulgences other than our basic needs was critical in order for us to accomplish the goal of getting to the mountains and also being debt free. And so we were determined to do that. And so we lived within our means and um, God did bless us. So we persevered, we saved every single penny, and every time we got a penny, I'd pay off the smaller debts first, get the bigger debts off after that, you guys know that principle, and um, we were quite minimal in what we had, but God said, you know what, where you're going, you're not going to need as much stuff as what you even have now. So he said, sell, sell as much as you can, what you don't think you'll need. And so we sold or we gave to charity a lot of our stuff. Um, and we used some of that money to pay off our debts. And just in that one year, just selling bits here and there, we sold about $6,000 worth of stuff. Um, we also had two vehicles at the time, so we got rid of his truck, which he was a little sad about, but... Um, that, was nice. <laughs> that was a nice truck. <laughs> but it only seated six, and we had eight people by this time. <laughs> so we let that one go, so then that was another... Um, debt off of our plates and I had a car and I'll just quickly tell the story because this to me is kind of a pretty miraculous thing I had this car and I you know my dad told me never buy a brand new car and I did twice in my life and this was the last one I bought mm -hmm. I was working at the time when I bought it and so I wanted a car that would I could drive into the ground so I bought a Volkswagen Jetta diesel brand new everything in it lots of money and because I, I was making good money at the time but then um, I switched focus, and I, we decided to have Fia. 
So I was at home. Yeah, that was a, that was earlier than this. That yeah, was that quite was, earlier. Yeah, yeah. So over time, we're like, okay, we got to get rid of this debt. We got to sell this car. Well, the market wasn't really so great, and what we'd sell it for wasn't going to be enough to pay off the loan that we had on it. So we thought, well, we'll just sit on it for a couple of years. Well, I think it was about a year later, Volkswagen had a big, I don't know if you guys heard of this, with their emissions. And so then the price of the Volkswagen just went and it tanked. And so we thought, oh my goodness, okay, we're going to be stuck with this forever. But a few months later, we got a letter in the mail from Volkswagen and they had a little two gift cards in there. One for Volkswagen, $500, and one you could spend wherever you want, these prepaid MasterCards. And this was part of their remuneration program to... Um, to help people or to kind of, you know, keep the peace. And uh, anyway, a class action lawsuit was started and we didn't really think anything of it. But about six months later, after that, we got another letter in the mail and we were given three options of what to do with this vehicle. And I can't remember all the options, but the one option that we chose was that we could sell our vehicle back to Volkswagen and they would give us cash back. Well, because I had been at home with a new baby, I hadn't put many kilometers on that car. Our kilometers were super low. So we owed about $16,000 on the car at the time. And the, the value that they gave us was $26,000. So it paid off the loan. And then the remaining 10 paid off the remainder of all of our other small debts. So all we had now was our, our home to pay off of our, our mortgage on our home. So our house was now ready to go. And I'll just show you a couple pictures of just a little bit of the change. It's no more orange carpets and Seb did a really good job renovating and the kids, Janae did a lot of painting and helped me paint. There's that bathroom without the orange carpet. And in fact, this, this clawfoot tub when we moved there we looked in the ground over in the bush and we could see the, the edge of something and here we dug out this clawfoot tub out of the ground and Seb restored it. Yeah, buried treasure. It was awesome. Yeah. And so it cost us nothing. But our time. There's that living room that we had there. No more stairs in there. As you can see, we like white. <laughs> it's nice and bright. Mm -hmm. Um, so this house wasn't just a physical renovation. Over the time that we spent doing this, it actually represented a major, major spiritual renovation in our lives as we worked through many personal struggles, not just us, but the kids and the transition of, because we were just new in the faith, we were coming out of the world and that whole mindset, and so it was a major um, personal renovation on ourselves as well. But before we put our house up for sale, God said we needed to start living off grid and start right where we were at. And so he told us to put in a garden. And it seemed kind of like a silly idea because we were going to be listing the house and, and somebody else would be getting our food. Um, but we put in a garden and we put in a back to Eden garden. And a lot of work up front, but... And our neighbors thought we were crazy because they couldn't understand what all these wood chips were. And we did this in our front yard. And they said, okay, happy to, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I remember some of the looks that they would give. They would walk by and just be like, Ugh. and then at the, end of the <laughs> at the end of the summer, they looked at it again. They're like, they're looking up instead of down. They're like, okay, I'm a believer now. Yeah, yeah. Just the plants were just like massive. It was awesome. Yeah, it was good. So we uh, sold and we donated most of our kitchen appliances, I did keep my blender, and we bought manual ones, and we bought cast iron pans and pots, and learned how to cook with them and bake with them on our electric stove, and I, I learned and taught the girls how to ferment and to preserve food, uh, to make our own herbal remedies, um, using what God provides in nature, and we started packing our belongings what we didn't need into Tupperware containers um, because we knew we were going to be going out into the wilderness. We knew there was going to be critters, and so we wanted to critter-proof everything. And we didn't even have a buyer in sight. We hadn't even put our house up yet, but we just wanted to be absolutely ready to go. So 
Train up a child in the way he should go. We talked about this this morning, actually. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. So all this time, since the start of our walk, we were deprogramming uh, the, the worldliness from ourselves and from our children. We rid our home of worldly movies, music, idols. Didn't have many toys, but just down to the basic educational toys. We focused on character building um, to build up spiritual children. We worked on ourselves. And um, our neighbors helped us to work on that, too. <laughs> I tell you, when you build a fence around your property, it can cause some problems. <laughs> um, and to this day, we're obviously, we're still working on our characters. It's a never-ending process, as you know. So the kids have been raised to be industrious and hardworking, to be problem solvers, to be good stewards. We've taught them to use their money wisely um, and uh, treat the things that God's given them well and to help where help is needed, and to even help where help isn't needed. And they learn how to cook and clean, and I tell you, these, these girls of mine, they could, sometimes I think, they could run the house better than I can. I could leave them for a couple of weeks and be okay with it. And it takes patience and it takes time to do all of this, but it is the most amazing gift that I believe you can give to your children, and I think that they feel the same way. So we educated them on the tribulation. It's not like we just moved down this path ourselves. We educated them why we needed to prepare, and um, we studied the gospel with them, the promises of God. It wasn't just all this doom and gloom. There's promises at the end of all this, right? And so the kids were involved in everything that we did and the whole journey of where we began, and they were on board of where we were going, and they understood like the importance of why we were doing this. So we had been praying for a buyer that would buy all of our furniture before we had um, left Camp to Mead Spring Feast in 2018. And, um, oh yeah, we were going to the Spring Feast. That's what we were doing, going to the Spring Feast. And we received an offer on our house just before we went to that feast. And God didn't just send us a buyer. He sent us a buyer that wanted to buy nearly all of our furniture. So... Judy always asked me to tell the story, so I will. <laughs> so while at the feast, the night before uh, First Fruits, Seb and I were talking about, you know, the possibility of moving to Camp to Mead, as it kind of was on the radar for the last six months. Um, and moving to a community, that was not something that we were really wanting to do <laughs> at all. In fact, it was kind of the last thing that we wanted to do. Um, we wanted a wilderness property of our own. We wanted to do it on our own. We just, we lived in a community with people, and we just, honestly, we just wanted our privacy, and we didn't want to be around anyone. We're kind of, we're kind of being a little antisocial, weren't we? <laughs> yeah, a little bit selfish. <laughs> yeah, a little bit selfish. <laughs> so our goal was to set up our own arc of safety for our family for the time of trouble. And, um, but that night, God he usually, he likes to speak to us through our dreams, and so he gave me a dream. And, um, and I was in the dream, I was up in the clouds, and it was kind of cloudy, and then all of a sudden, the clouds parted, and this big sunbeam came down, and it shone just right over the camp, over top of the roundhouse here. And I could hear, in the dream, I could hear the angels, and they were singing this chorus of music, and it was just a really peaceful, really, just angelic scene. And so when I woke up the next morning, I said to Seb, I think we're supposed to move to Camp to Mead. <laughs> so we knew that it was much against our will, but we knew this is where God wanted us to be. And I always find that um, God's ways usually go against our will. Do you guys find that? Because it's like if, we, if we're really on board with something and we want to do it, it's probably our own will. But if it's not our own will, it's usually God's, God's ways. And his ways are kind of uncomfortable, aren't they? It was going to be uncomfortable for us. We knew that. Um, so the next day came after my dream, and it was first fruits that next day. And I think that was even the last day of the feast, to be honest, because there wasn't a whole lot of people here. And I had received an email from our realtor that day. Well, our house sale was final and closed 10 days early on First Fruits, which was an unexpected surprise for us. And so we knew that God must be up to something. 
So um, before we drove back to Alberta, uh, we actually sat down with Tom and Judy and we had a good detailed discussion and um, about the possibility of us moving here. And they invited our family to prayerfully consider moving to Camp to Meet. And um, we had been looking at, we spent hours and hours and hours on realtor.com and we'd looked at so many other different properties, but um, God just, he, there was just no, you know, when you get that feeling, it's like, okay, this is, this is the right path. We just weren't getting that. There was just always something just off about all the other properties that we looked at. And so after about two weeks of a lot of prayer and conviction and um, we contacted Tom and, and told him that if he'd have us, that we would love to move to camp to meet. I like this verse. This is one of the verses that really helped me when we were moving. And, and the Lord said unto Abram, get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father, father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And so our family of eight, we left our families and um, we made two trips with our suburban and 10 foot trailer and moved our entire lives from Alberta to here on May 24th of last year. We were 100% debt free. We had savings to build an ark and we were ready to serve the ministry in whatever way that we could. And so I kind of have a little bit of a ministry, I guess. I'm not on social media, but I am on Instagram, and it's kind of just built up over the years. And one of the biggest questions um, that I get asked is, how do you fund this kind of lifestyle, and what do you do for work? And Seb's kind of addressed that a little bit. But um, to that, I like to answer, we saved, and we denied ourselves of everything but our basic needs. Because the price is not too much to pay to, uh, to follow the vision that God's wanting us to follow. And so we, we sacrificed, we work really hard, Seb er worked extra hard, um, we renovated the house, we didn't hire anything out. And I know not everyone can do that, um, but everyone can check uh, what they're buying, um, what you're spending your money on, uh, we would go to the restores, we would search the buy and sells for secondhand things. We tried not to buy new. Um, and because of our thriftiness in renovating almost an entire 1,800 square feet of a home, plus another 350 square feet, we, put a, we actually put a, a loft above the garage, which was just open rafters at the time, and all the landscaping and everything. So it wasn't easy, but we knew that all the work would pay off. And... Um, and so we have enough money to build our ark and enough money to pay for our cost of living while doing that. That was our goal. And, and it's not like it just happened overnight. This was a goal that we'd worked towards for three years, three, four years. Um, and every family is unique. You know, God gives us creative skills in different areas and he guides everyone a different way. It doesn't have to be the way we did it. This is just our story. Thank you, Tosh. <laughs> She tells that way better than I do. So why did we choose Camp to Mead? Out of all the properties that we searched, why did we actually choose Camp to Mead of all places? These were the three things that were the most important to us. Conviction. God chose Camp to Mead for us. We are convicted that, that God chose Camp to Mead for us. Leadership. We felt that Tom was very capable and a serving leader, and we shared the same vision as he did for the, mini for the ministry, and we were willing to submit to his authority as a leader. This was actually really important to us. And, you know, we're going to talk about community a little later this week, but if you're going to go to a community, and I'm not trying to, you know, put Tom on a pedestal, this could be any community that you go to, you want to make sure that you have a leader in place that is <coughs> a servant leader. And, um, and I'll show you some pictures later this week, but this, this guy right here, you guys have seen him this week. He gets right in there. He's not sitting on his office desk, you know, barking mm -hmm. orders at everyone and get me that and get me this, you know. <laughs> so leadership is to us was really important. And that was, you know, other than the conviction of God, 
and I think I can speak for all of the residents who live here, would you be here if your leader wasn't a good leader? No, mm -hmm. you wouldn't be. Um, you know, if he was a dictatorial leader or something like that, you'd probably be like, well, camp to me, it's probably not for me, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. So this was important to us. And so um, with the leadership of both Tom and Judy, we, we really appreciate that leadership. And, and that's something that we do not regret um, in coming to this, mm -hmm. this community. And ministry work. We knew that we wanted to be a part of this ministry and help share the message as much as we could. It wasn't just about us preparing our own arc of safety. It was also about educating others on how to do the same and to help um, to share to the world, to help to share to the world. Yeah. We're really, if you get us talking, we're really kind of passionate about this preparing and, and we really enjoy it. And, you know, and there's a lot of people that don't even know where to start. So we, we like to share how to do it and, and how you even get started. And so, so now we arrive at Camp to Me. So when we arrived, we rented, um, temporarily rented two cabins. We had a big family. So these cabins, as you know, they're about, what are they, 500 square feet? 500 square feet each. And um, so there we were, learning the lifestyle firsthand. There's Holly. <clears throat> For the first little while, we washed our dishes outside, and we called that the washing table. And you can see the outhouse in the back. That was right behind our cabin. And so we used that for the most part. Um, but uh, you guys know where the wash house is down here, so we use that for showers and, and whatnot too. So plumbing down there. And we learned how to wash our clothes in pails so that we knew how to accomplish this primitively. Yeah, we just wanted to do it for fun. We to, did. To see yeah. How to do it. Yeah, because mm -hmm. you're not, we're not always going to have washing machines. There won't always be power for washing machines. And so Zach and Fia thought that was pretty fun to do this. And it actually works pretty good. And we learned how to cook on top of the wood stove. And my goal was to learn how to, to bake bread inside of the oven. And so between Alicia and I, we figured it out, and we were just so happy about that. So, like right, inside the right inside the fireplace, yeah, inside of a cast iron pot. With her, with her uh, knowledge and mind put together, we did it, and we were so excited. Well, you guys got some bread when we did that. <laughs> 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 and we had some very dirty children along the way. So... After living on the property for about a month and helping with the abundance of camp projects that needed to be accomplished, um, you know, because we felt it was a good idea and it was recommended, come and live, see if you like it, see if we like you and you like us and, you know, before we made any permanent moves. And so we did that and um, we felt that our family would be a good fit and uh, we confirmed this with Tom and Judy and we moved forward to making our stay permanent. And so we were given the opportunity to clean up and renew the state of this cabin. It was abandoned and, you know, like all the other cabins, what you see here, they were in a state of disrepair. And I don't know if, I wonder, do you still have that one on, I don't think it's there, but showing you holding all your little friends and, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, it was overrun by friends and mold and all kinds of things and so I'll we'll just rat friends. yeah rat <laughs> friends and mice friends and all that kind of stuff so this is when you first drive into the property and you look on the right hand side that's that kind of field on that side of the the cabin there and this is we started taking apart the front here because it just kind of looked like a big long shoe box and and we didn't really like the look of that. <laughs> and we didn't like the look of the red either. <laughs> Actually, I don't think anyone liked the look of the red. <laughs> Who paints a cabin red? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and so this is actually the, the river. Well, I call it the river. It's a creek, but I'm going to call it the river. This is the riverside part. And this addition was about, I think, around 600 square feet. And it came within... 20 feet of where that creek runs right now. So in a high year, I mean, with all the mold and everything, we could tell that it had just come up underneath. It was wet underneath the house. And I said to Seb, when we looked at this place, and I said, I said, I'd never do another renovation. 
And I, I said, please, can we not just build? And he said, no, we can do this. And I said, no, this is way bigger than what we've ever done. And he said, no, we can do this. And I said, oh, okay. And the only reason why you got me to do it is because that river was right there. And so I didn't have a lake anymore, but I would have a river. Mm -hmm. Without the kids' help, I don't think we would have actually done this. But So here's that uh, front part. We started tearing that apart. And that was um, interesting. Actually, those logs there, when Seb got up there, will you tell him what those logs were doing? Yeah, what were they doing again? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, there's well, so many. There were so many things wrong with the place that I don't remember. Anymore. Well, it's actually a good thing that we tore it apart because when we went to take the logs apart, we we found that they were actually these front oh, ones. Yeah. They were what sitting. Oh, they were ready to fall down. Another season yeah. of snow. That whole thing would have probably caved in. It was the beams were like the whole building shifted, and the beams were just like that much, like just maybe hanging half an on. inch, at, like three quarters of an inch. Yeah, ready to fall. Yeah. So there's Seb, and he's he made us take a lot of slow mo videos as the logs came rolling off. <laughs> it was pretty dramatic, and so we worked on that and. He's just contemplating why we even started this in the first place. <laughs> and actually, when it got to that point, we are like, oh my goodness, this is so bad. <laughs> but we were getting there, got that off. And there's some of the mess underneath. There's somebody nicely put insulation underneath, but it wasn't covered. So all the wet came up and all the critters really enjoyed it. So that was a pretty big job. And I don't have many shots of the inside, but this is one of the original shots of the living room. You can see in this picture, there's the kids, and we call it the year of the 10,000 nails. And we pulled all the nails. I shouldn't say we. <laughs> they laugh when I say we. I didn't pull any nails. They pulled nails. And we saved. We, we salvaged. Is, if the wood was good, we saved it and every single nail was pulled. So there they are saving, saving the wood. And there's Holly, she's taken out some garbage again. And so it started coming along and here we'd moved, so we'd taken the logs from the front and we'd moved them to the back, which is where we enter in, which you guys can see when you drive in. And um, Alan actually helped Seb a little bit on this and it was kind of nice because yeah, Alan's a, a pretty strong guy. <laughs> yeah, that was awesome. Yeah. Yeah, and those logs are not so fun to get up there. And I think you guys did it all by hand, didn't you? Did you use a tractor at all? Yeah, we used a tractor. Yeah, maybe we just. Uh, yeah, we got to use the tractor for the for the last beams. We yeah put those on with the tractor. Yeah. And not only did we have the cabin to rebuild, but there had been years and years of uh, people that had lived there, and they nicely left all their stuff for us. So it was just waiting for us to clean up. And uh, so there's Janae, she's pressure washing that red off of the main cabin. And um, we're finally at a point, and this is October of last year, where we could re-roof. And so after four and a half months, with hundreds of hours of work and thousands of nails being pulled, um, we moved into a literal skeleton of a cabin. We had an old wood stove and we were locked up and that was good enough for us. <laughs> Actually, the, the roof and the floor were insulated, so. And so that's what it looked like when we moved in. Just one big open space. Clean. Yeah, so we didn't have any furniture, because remember, we sold most of our furniture from in Alberta. Not even any mattresses. We were sleeping on our camping cots. And uh, we had a few long desks that we use as our kitchen counters. And for the first month, we filled our water bottles over here at the camp for drinking water. And uh, we showered at the main camp, and we pailed water of the creek to wash the dishes, and we dug a hole in the ground in the bush, surrounded with plywood, and that was our, our fancy loo. <laughs> <laughs> and we spent from the middle of November until the beginning of March insulating the walls, doing some plumbing, and running the electrical. And, um, and we installed our new wood cook stove and range boiler. Does anyone know what a range boiler is? Well, it hooks up to through uh, coils that come out of the back of our stove, our wood stove, and it's essentially what it is. It's uh, like a hot water tank, and but it runs by convection. So you've got it up high, 
and it heats the water, doesn't use any electricity, and it uh, heats all of our domestic hot water. So it's a pretty cool thing. Um, so by December, we had finally had running water, a toilet, a bathtub, and a shower, and we actually felt really guilty because no one over here had any of that in their house. <laughs> so we felt like we were I living like Tom, kings and queens. Tom did, I think. Tom did, but we felt bad for everyone else. <laughs> we actually did. <laughs> so, yeah, then Seb put up some walls and um, some walls, but we still had sheet walls and uh, part of our kitchen cabinets. And then things started coming together. Now we're rolling around into spring. And so our thing, you know, the Bible says, plant your gardens and then build your house, right? And we had actually had brought 70 pounds worth of potatoes the year that we moved here. I don't know why we drug them all the way from Alberta, you know, but we did. And we planted them like sod potatoes. But the moles got, and the voles got all of them except for a little handful. But we did try. We just didn't have time to get to it. Actually, Jeanette gave us some vegetables and stuff too, and they, they just didn't fare well because we just couldn't. So we had to fence most of our yard here to keep the deer and, um, and also our dog out of the garden. And we spent weeks hauling branches so that we could wood chip the gardens because we were going to continue with this back to Eden method. And um, so that's what we did. And so you guys... You're a little late in the season, but this is what our garden did look like this season. Um, this is just one of the gardens. Um, this is my garden, and I have this one, and I have another little one by the cabin, and everyone says, well, why do you, why do you have a, ca a garden, and why does Seb have a garden? Because we're both creative, and we both love gardening, and it keeps the peace. <laughs> <laughs> so here's a couple more pictures of the gardens. Um, we planted... Uh, hmm? Beautiful. Yeah, Thank we you. planted... We planted uh, 42 apple trees. We've got blueberries, hascaps, raspberries, grapes, um, and cherry trees. So we got all that in because it takes time to establish that, as all you gardeners know. <coughs> I'll just quickly go through these. Just a few images. Some of our, this was from one plant, of potatoes from one plant. And I was pretty happy to be able to grow I'd never grown a lot of this stuff before because we never had a real good opportunity to do it. But when you get a big garden, it's kind of fun to... Mm -hmm. Potatoes. Zach loved going out into the garden. And we had flowers, lots of flowers. Am I going too fast? There's some big potatoes. That's actually not the biggest one. We had one. I weighed it on the scale, and it was just under three pounds. Wow. I was like, whoa. It's just another shot here. Here's Holly harvesting some of her herbs. The girls chick have peas. their, yeah, the girls have, oh, those are, chi yeah, you always say that, chickpeas. And I always say it's herbs, but it's chickpeas. Mm -hmm. The girls have their own garden across uh, the, s the street from us, so they grew a bunch of stuff too. Here's Janae harvesting some pumpkins. That's just half of what we got. And a lot of this stuff, um, we didn't get our gardens going until well into end of May. Pumpkins I didn't plant until close to the end of June, and I thought, oh, I'll just throw some seed in and see what they do. Well, they did actually the best of everything, to be honest. Just a few things here. So here's in the back here. Now, don't let those hammocks fool you. We just put them up for decoration. <laughs> No, <laughs> they never got used. <laughs> I think I went in it once or twice. I, yeah, maybe once. And I felt guilty. Um, we bought an Alaska mill. I bought an Alaska mill for Seb for his birthday so we could mill our own wood. And even though the, we have a big mill here, it's kind of nice to have you know, your own at home so that you can quickly whip things up. Yeah. We built a chicken coop so that we could eat our own organic eggs. We have 36 chickens, two ducks, and Janae's got, I think, around 10 of her own. There's Bree. And um, we hired Alan, actually, initially, to build this 10 by 12 chicken coop. That was our, our original chicken coop. And then when Seb finished putting up the tin, we looked at each other and we said, this is too nice for a chicken coop. <laughs> so way too nice of a job yeah he did a good job and that's all reclaimed wood that we use so we use it for our guest bunkie because we don't have room in our cabin if people come to stay so it, it sleeps about two and um 
and we just put a wood stove in here recently, so it actually works really nicely. I've been working out there on my presentations, and I have peace and quiet, so it kind of makes for a nice little office if I need it. We also built an outhouse this spring. Uh, there may not always be running water, so it's good to have one of these guys on your property. Um, and it's also conveniently set up for our, our guests out if they stay in the bunkie. And then we uh, are in the process of finishing up our root cellar um, and to hold everything from our garden that we harvested this year. This is going to be a, a great building to have for the time of the end when there's limited power and um, it's going to act really well for uh, storage, for food storage, um, uh, especially during the months where you can't have a garden. It's going to be great. And I like it too because, and I'll talk about our fridge situation later, but uh, ever since we've got this set up, it's hovering around, I think right now, three and a half degrees. So it's in that range of fridge temperature. So I have a nice big fridge right now as well. Um, but we just have to actually finish putting on that front piece uh, with the whole double door system and make it look a little prettier than what it is. And then we also plan to have some bees next year. We actually have a couple uh, hives and some equipment already, but we just didn't have time to get it all set up for uh, pollinating, for gardens and that kind of thing. You'll have much better gardens if you have pollinators. So Seb mentioned that we homeschool, and our main schooling consists of what I like to call life schooling. Um, obviously, we do the basics, math, English, reading, that sort of thing. But um, our focus is not so much on um, university academics because, well, we don't believe that there'll be a need for university in the time of the end here. So learning skills and how to be industrious is what's important to us. And these kids have learned so much. Here's uh, Seb and Trey, and Seb's teaching Trey how to build a dog house and he built his very first dog house a month ago and he's been commissioned by Tom to build another dog house for Tom's dog so that's pretty exciting for him and this is just one of our very hard workers Holly and this is actually right across from us is a little cabin over here and um, we have the potential to fix this one up for Janae and Holly and so they were working on this. They stripped off all the old wood shingles that were on there. They gutted the inside, and that's Holly standing on the roof. A lot of work. They burnt that whole big pile there. Um, right, actually, and they moved it to right where their garden is, and they got all the nails out. And so they're going to have a really good garden with all those nice ashes. And speaking of the garden, there's Janae. That was her this spring planting. Uh, onion bulbs. Her and Holly had that garden over there this year. And so they were quite excited in the late in the fall. We told them that they could all have a garden. We'd buy all the seed this year, but the deal was is that whatever they grew, they had to save the seed from so that they could plant again next year. And so they did. And uh, most of the fencing that you see around our property, we cut the logs and fine young tray here mostly. He used the draw knife to peel them and then we used, uh, I'll never say the name right, but it's a Japanese method of uh, pressure treating your wood and you just burn the wood and uh, it'll last for, if they say, over a hundred years. So that's what we did instead of putting uh, any kind of, what is it? Uh, what's that chemical? Copper sulfate or is it, you can use different chemicals. Yeah. But this works pretty good. Yeah. And there's Janae and Trey. So again, more learning. Janae learned how to fence this year, and so did Trey. So they did up Janae's chicken coop, which is across the road from us there. And there's never a lack of learning in the kitchen. And Seb's always teaching them how to build. Anytime we're building anything, he's always got somebody over there teaching them how to build. And you can see that preparation includes all ages. <laughs> so 
how do we cook? We cook on our wood stove. This is a wood cook stove. We bought this from West Virginia, actually. Um, the Amish built it, and we had it shipped up. And it's um, an amazing stove. It's, it, has a, it has a thermostatic control on it, so we can adjust it to temperature. Uh, we get anywhere between an, about an 11 to 13 hour burn time on it. And I can get my oven up to 500 degrees so that we can bake bread. Because if you don't have a hot oven for bread, you're going to have flat bread. <laughs> That's what we know. So the inside of our cabin isn't completely finished, but this is just kind of a snapshot of the kitchen of what is done right now. And this is a common scene in our house with the girls in the kitchen working away there and cooking and that sort of thing. Um, now we do have a small freezer that we did buy. It's an efficient freezer and that's what we use obviously to freeze, but we don't have a refrigerator. We built a room right when you come in the door and sub insulated it and we put vents to the outside. So in the cold months it works really well because the cold air comes in and we can kind of regulate it and cover up the little vents if we need to, but it keeps it really good fridge temperature in there. And uh, as soon as it warms up, what we did this summer is we froze containers, jugs in the freezer, and then we just have a couple coolers inside of that little kind of closet. And uh, that's how we've kept our food cold and it's uh, worked really well. But now that we have the root cellar, it, it might work as a year round refrigerator. We'll see how that goes. Almost thinking about maybe um, cutting some ice out in the winter time and uh, putting some in there and covering it with straw to maintain that and keep it nice and cool in that root cellar in the summertime. So, you know, it's kind of a fun experiment to do these things and all you gotta do is just give it a try. Um, I bought this iron like 10 years ago as a decorative piece. I like vintage things, not knowing that this year we'd actually be using it on our stove and we'd actually be using it to iron our material when we did our sewing and whatnot, but it works really good. And um, we love to sew at our place and I've always wanted a treadle sewing machine. So I made a post on Instagram one day saying, you know, if anyone knows of a treadle machine in the area that's for sale, let me know. Now, most of my Instagrammers are actually from the States, so they're not really that close. But I had a, a wonderful woman named Carol and she's from Washington, about three and a half hours from us. And she said, Tasha, if you come and get it, I'll give you mine for free. And so I said, oh, I'd love to come because she has an amazing garden and everything. But we went down in the winter and it was a real blessing to meet her and her husband. He's a pastor and we had a wonderful chat. And so I brought it back and gave it a little facelift with some paint and distressing because it was in a bit of a rough shape, but it works well. Seb oiled it up and fixed it up for me. And I also have an electric machine and um, my stepmom's actually sending back from Alberta in this month another treadle machine. So we'll have two, which is great for quilting because you can never have enough sewing machines. Um, for laundry, we have an efficient real washing machine. And as Tom says, let's not bring the time of trouble upon ourselves before we need to. <laughs> so with eight people, you know, scrubbing laundry is, is real fun and we might have to do that one day, but for right now, we're just not gonna do that. But we do hang our laundry, we don't have a dryer. And uh, so that's what we do with that. And uh, this is just some of the herbs that we collected this year, but um, for sustainability, we dry, we ferment, we can, and seed saving is a huge thing. Uh, when we planted our seed this year and everything grew, we, we kind of picked off of it a little bit for the most part, um, but we actually wanted to build up our seed collection. So we ended up collecting probably anywhere from four to eight times more seed than what we actually planted. So, And we did plant garlic last year. And so I yielded about 262 cloves to plant this year. But I did buy, there's a, a seed um, a farm just up in Lumbee, which is only about an hour and a half away, an organic seed farm. And I bought 800 more cloves to plant. So I'll be doing that after Tabernacles when I have a little bit of time and get those in the ground because we eat a lot of garlic and it's 
highly medicinal. And we've also planted some spring flower bulbs because, you know, having a beautiful property is always nice. And we just got our solar system and actually we're trying to work on it this week. So Seb just put up the four panels um, last week actually. And up to this point, we've been running off of a 2800 kilowatt generator and it's been um, running all of our needs fairly decently. Uh, we'd run it for a few hours in the morning just for you know laundry and that sort of thing. And then we pretty much keep it off all day and then uh, we come back on around, you know, after when it starts to get dark. And, uh, and we turn it on periodically throughout the day if we needed the pump for the water and that sort of thing. But that was another way for us to kind of conserve fuel and that sort of thing. So we still have a lot more winter projects to do. We uh, plan on hopefully building a wood shelter, gathering more firewood, uh, finishing the root cellar, chipping more wood chips for garden expansion, uh, getting the solar actually connected to the whole cabin, running off of that, and finishing the inside of the cabin. Um, but with all that we've done to build our arc of safety, we also are a part of this ministry. And so each of the families on this property, we, are, we put in, um, everyone 12 and up puts in their eight hours of work each week. That's what we're required to do. And um, so this is to run not only the ministry aspect, because there's all kinds of, as you guys can see this week, we've got people on cameras, we've got people um, behind the scenes um, doing books and uh, burning c CDs and stuff, or DVDs, I guess DVDs, right? To send out to people all over that are asking for them. We have uh, maintenance to do on the grounds, um, all kinds of things in the wintertime. What's that? Firewood, that's a big one. Yeah, firewood. Uh, so there's never a lack of work around here. And so as a, as a team here, we, we do all of that and keep it all running. So are you starting to think that all we do is work? Yeah? Well, that's not all that we do here. <laughs> this is the wilderness, and we got lots of things that we can do. And although it takes a lot of time to establish and be prepared, we still have to make time for our families. And I mean, we're in God's country, so there's lots of things to do out here. And so here the, here's Seb with the kids skidooing this past winter. And this was a winter that actually didn't have as much snow as they normally get. So maybe this winter I hear that we're supposed to get a lot more. Plenty of places to enjoy a picnic here. Um, and we're like the swimming hole family, so we like to go find really awesome swimming holes, and there's not a shortage of those, and the, the idea is to find one that's really big and really deep so that they can find lots of fish. And there's kayaking, places to go kayaking, and all these places are just like within, what, 20 minutes, maybe maximum 30 minutes. This one here, you can see the kids up on the cliff. It doesn't look very big, but I jumped up that cliff, and that was the first and the last time. <laughs> and so that's pretty fun. And the girls and I love foraging for wild herbs, so we're always out. That's fun for us. We love doing that sort of thing. And uh, we have, what do we have? We have wild thimbleberries, raspberries, huckleberries, blueberries. What else do we have? What's that? Elderberries. Mm -hmm. Yeah, elderberries. Does anyone know how much it costs to buy a little bag of elderberries? No? I do. <laughs> it's expensive. It's about, uh, I think it's about for just a little tiny little bag, and they're pretty light. I think it's, you know, $15 or something like that. So I collected, and I think Tabitha actually collected some this year too. I collected and I, weigh, I dried them and I weighed them. And if I would have had to buy them in the store, it would have cost me $120 to buy them in the store. And that amount of elderberries will last a really long time. And I learned about elderberries is that they grow uh, really fast. Two years about they take to grow eight feet by eight feet. And what you do is we actually found, um, the kids found a row just down over here out in the field, a really long row. 
and um, you go out in the spring when it's still when it's just coming out of dormancy, and you cut below the there's a little nodes on them, and you cut right below one. And you just take it and you stick it in the ground, or you could start it in water if you want. And um, so not only do they provide some sort of uh, cover for say your yard, but they also give you the berries, and they're actually a really beautiful plant too. Uh, Ariel, this is that waterfall we were talking about. It's just up the road down, and it's a really beautiful site. And there's always time for animals around here. Janae especially loves to spend time with her chickens and whatnot. And we like to take our Sabbath afternoons and go out exploring. And we take our horse and carriage, there it is, out to the fields. And it gets us somewhere real fast. And finally, there are even special places for <laughs> dates. <laughs> well, the kids were on our date that day. <laughs> That's who took the picture. <laughs> yeah. Well, we could set it up. Like, we do that sometimes. But. So, and I just wanted to add one more aspect to preparation. Um, we can't think of a better place than a remote wilderness location to prepare our characters. We kind of call it like our Enoch experience, I guess, and being away from the distractions of the world is a blessing and has been a blessing to our family and I know it has been to the other residents that live here as well. I'm sure I can vouch for all of you. Life in the cities is a whirlwind of display and distraction. There is no security anywhere on this planet, but we would serve our families best by removing them from the thousands of evils that the cities entice us with. Consider that there will be a time of trouble such as never was. Think about all that has happened in history all over the planet. Nothing will compare to what we will see very soon. Do you? Well, I was just going to say, who can think of some of the really bad things that have happened in history? Can you give me some? The Black Plague, okay, yeah. The Holocaust. Irish starvation. The persecution during the Dark Ages. Time of trouble such as never was. Nothing will compare to it. Like, you know, I can't even imagine what it's going to be like. Can you? No. Are we going to make it through where we're at right now? Will we spiritually be able to handle what's coming? Are we preparing spiritually right now? Will we be able to feed our families for over three years? These are things to ponder. So by faith, Noah, being warned of God, of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of righteousness, which is by faith. Hebrews 11, 7. So are you going to prepare your ark? God is calling us out of the cities and even out of even places that are even kind of close to the cities, small towns, even, even out of small towns. Um, tomorrow we're going to be talking about preliminary end times preparation and practical steps that you can take right now, no matter where you're at. And no matter what your situation is, no matter where you are living, um, if you purpose in your heart to prepare for the wonderful return of Yeshua, God will make a way for each and every one of you. So let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you again. And we just ask as we as we look at these things and as we look into the future, as we look into prophecy as we have this week, and we see some of the frightening things that, that will take place, we ask that you help us to do a work now. You help us to prepare now, physically, spiritually, and you help us to take these things seriously. You say that a prudent man sees, foresees the evil and he hides himself, and we ask 
that you give us that you give us wisdom we're asking for wisdom and i pray that you bless everyone in this room with wisdom and anyone listening as well we thank you father amen amen, amen.